When regression taxation has gone too far And your bloody Mary's just not up to par It's more Mondays Yeah, here we are with Maura Quint, another very special Maura Mondays, the uh, Christmas week, your birthday week. (laughs) Thanks for saying it. I wasn't going to. I I did it last time. It was too much. I was way over the top. I wasn't going to say it anymore. I put a post-it note on my camera. Don't forget. And the really upsetting thing. Sorry, I'm going to cut you off only to say some someone who follows me on Twitter, like that I do not know in real life, sent me a screenshot that my birthday was in their eye calendar. It was just like Mara Quinn's birthday. Like it auto populated in somehow. I have no idea why, but it was really upsetting. That can happen. That's interesting. That can happen. I've had things like that pop up in my calendar that aren't like in my life, there's somebody else's life. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. But that's also maybe they maybe they put it down. That's I mean, see, what I did, I put a reminder down because I didn't want to forget. I knew I was going to talk to you. So anyway, hmm. birthday that's week, weird. birthday week, Christmas week. But you're Jewish, so but you're kind of like, what are you going to do? We're going to hang out with your kids Christmas Eve and do stuff. Um. So I I have a kind of strange family. So not strange, but um, I, it's not super straightforward. My dad is Catholic. My mom is Jewish. So we were raised Jewish and I was raised with Hanukkah, but my dad's family is the the large family side. So like we would always go to aunts and uncles houses for Christmas. Um, and then now I'm, I'm divorced and um, my kid's dad is, is Christian. So they'll be with him for Christmas. Um, I was going to travel, but <laughs> Amrakan came and shut that all down. So I'm not sure what I'm doing now. So you can't. So you canceled your plans on account of Omicron, and I want to talk about that with you. Yeah, yeah, that's because what it's really. Uh, you had a tweet about this. Uh, I gotta try to find it now. Ah, oh, damn, I was just ready. But basically, it's really hard for everybody because we keep having to change our plans, and it's like there's not really anybody to blame i mean you can if you want to but i I, i'm not sure you wrote celebrating the holidays again with our new tradition of last minute canceling everything it's like the second year in a row that's happened and you you put it perfectly there but i mean what are we supposed to do how are we supposed to think about it like it feels like you want to blame somebody and it causes a lot of problems because maybe we're not on the same page what are we supposed to do everybody wants to blame someone I'm, i'm noticing that a lot more this time around we were all just so tired of it. And I think we thought what it was done. And yet here we are going through the same thing again. It's it's infuriating. And so now I think there's a lot more anger coupled with it this time around. Yeah, there's a lot more anger coupled with it, but it's it's causing a lot of problems for people because, you know, family members that have plans want to get together. Some, you know, someone reasonably says, I think we should still have our gathering. And someone also reasonably says, I don't think we should like it's I can make an argument about we're all vac- vaccinated. We've all got the booster where you're even telling us we got to wear masks we'll wear, like all. And then some of I just don't feel safe. And you kind of got to be respect. I think you have to respect, especially the people who say I don't feel safe. I, that's how do we morally fall down on these? Things? <laughs> yeah, no, there's nothing else you can do. I mean, everybody has to make that decision for themselves. But also everyone's calculations are different. And even if you're there, your family or whatnot, they they could have other circumstances that they're maybe not disclosing to you that make them feel one way or another, especially people who are going a little bit um, or who are making the choice to be as extra safe as possible. There's lots of reasons for that. The reasons can be, you know, physical. Maybe they have undisclosed ailments that they don't want to share, but they're, they make them vulnerable in some way, or they interact with people who have vulnerabilities in their lives. And so they don't want to spread it, or maybe they just have you know, maybe that sort of thing actually like sets them in a mental, emotional, psychological loop of fear. And that emotionally isn't worth it. I mean, there's like lots of reasons for people to. want. Yeah. To yeah. Really like, uh, you know what? I want to come. But if I come, I'm going to be worried the whole time. And who wants to be around that person? Who wants to be that person? I'd rather not come and be and be less concerned. And while that's not maybe my point of view, I got to respect it if, if if someone else feels that way, I feel. Yeah. Or they might know like, hey, that's going to I'm going to be set off into being in this like hyper vigilant panic state for the next week or two. And that's going to ruin all of the rest of the things that I need to do or get through. I mean, everybody 
everybody's grappling with their own stuff. So yeah, all we can do is just respect respect one another. And then of course there's a new wrinkle in in the virus and that it's an, a new variant. And so we still really don't quite know exactly about this variant. And now is not the time to be unsure of it. Like we know Delta was was devastating and continues to be. We don't know about this one. And so you kind of have to rework your arguments with your family and be like, listen, I would have if, but now with this new variant, who knows? And they say sometimes, you know, they have got some things that are saying it's, it's affecting kids more. My kids not uh, got all their vaccinations or whatever it might be. If your kids are really young, of course. So there's a lot of fair concerns when there's a new wrinkle is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to give people you know, excuse to to justify whatever their concerns might be. Yeah, no, I just went through that just this past week because we were in a place like my kids are now vaccinated. I'm vaccinated. We were in a place where we were starting to like, you know, live life a little more pre pandemic normally, it, you know, not completely, but a little bit more. And my brother uh, came up from D.C. and we kind of we shut everything down because we were planning to see people who were going to be vulnerable. So we wanted to be really isolated for a while. And my brother is like, you know, going out to um, what's that place with all the video games and bowling and stuff, Dave and Buster's and, uh, you know, going to like, in, I mean, he's wearing a mask and stuff, but he's like going into these more populated places. And so then I didn't want to see my brother because, you know, he's now he's taking a much he's much more comfortable with the risk. He doesn't feel like he has any reason not to. So I had to distance myself from him, which, you know, was fine. He wasn't upset about, but, but, but you know, for two other people, it might not be fine. He might then this in another case be like, you know, oh, what? Yeah. I resent you for being so cautious. I want to see you. You're my sister. And, you know, you could you couldn't blame people in a way for that because their intentions are I want to see you. I want to be with you. And yours are like, I wanted to. But I just you're you're, you're you keep going bowling. I, I mean, mean, I understand the draw of the bowl is big at Dave and Buster's and the bowling alley. When and, else do you get to hurdle some large rock at uh, at things and knock it down like that? There is a, a tremendous amount of satisfaction in that. And I think we all need to hurl some large boulders. It really is. It things. really yeah. is. I really thought about Feels the, good. Satis- good. the satisfaction of watching your bowling ball knock down a bunch of pins really is a, a metaphor for things. And I never <laughs> really looked at it that way. And yet I, I did just bowl this past summer. All right. I want to play something for you. I can't, I want to do this nor just add a little extra layer of our conversations to get your reaction on a thing. I should have told you this before, but you'll have no problem with this. Maybe you've already seen it. This is the governor of Florida tripping on his dick when he's on Fox business friendly Mia Maria Bartiromo's show. And she asks him a question. He's clearly not prepared to answer from her and he has to calculate well i won't say anything more you can hear this right mm-hmm. yeah we're not even sure what fully vaccinated means anymore the other day dr fauci said you know we could be that uh fully vaccinated means three shots which is two shots for the vaccination and then one booster shot have you gotten the booster so uh, I, I've done whatever I did, the, the normal shot. And, you know, that at the end of the day is people's individual decisions about what they want to do. But these boosters in terms now, Florida, we don't we ban vaccine passports. We, we won't let them fire you, even private businesses over this because we don't think that's appropriate. Governor. So, Mara. What do you think of his like non answer? Like, why did he not want to answer? whether or not he got the booster. There's no question that every single person who's been vaccinated knows exactly how many shots they've had. And certainly if you're a politician, you know. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's that's as good as a yes, I got the booster. If he hadn't gotten it, he'd be very excited to tell that. So, I mean, that's that's just sheer straightforward admission there. But I also just laugh every time. I love the shit that they're always this free market, you know, businesses should be allowed to do whatever they want. (laughs) <laughs> they don't have to serve gay people. They don't have to do, let ladies in if they don't want to. Oh, but wait, <laughs> they're doing something we don't like. Nope, nope, shut it down. We're going to make that illegal. It's a, weird, it, it's a really weird thing when it comes to uh, safety measures. Yeah. You know, they're, they're telling they're telling the business they can't take the safety measures the business wants to take. It's not even a government OSHA mandate. It's like, no, we as a business. Yeah, we, private business. Want people to wear clothes when they come in. Mm-hmm. That's what we want. And they're saying you can't you can't have it. 
Yeah, no, as a business, I am making it mandatory that no one can come in my store and pee on the other customers. Nope, sorry. If they want to come in and pee on your other customers, that's just, you're going to have to let that happen. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really wild. But clearly, the Everyone's more important- Everyone's peeing in Florida, I assume. On one yeah. Level. It's just, that's how I picture Florida. But But I mean, just to be clear, he is giving an unanswer so that he doesn't lose politically from the anti-vax uh, folks because that's how big of a constituency they are now. He needs them to vote for him. So he's not going to be honest about whether or not he's gotten the booster. And, and, and I said this on Twitter, that directly leads to death because he's a leader and he's not leading. He's not telling the people what to to do when he knows the answer and has done it himself. Is that well, too- that's that's why he uh, that's why he has to hesitate and hedge. You're right. He cannot lose any of their votes because they're dying off so quickly. You know, his margins are getting smaller. He's got to keep the ones that are there. If you make it through, you got to vote for me. You know, you can't have any reason not to show up at the polls. So it's a, it's a political calculation there. All right. So let me change gears from COVID and talk about the I'm not going to say more important issue because COVID is really important, especially what we're seeing happening across the country right now. And but I want to talk about uh, the death of Build Back Better, at least temporarily. I mean, I would love to, to think that we can somehow revive at least parts of it. But Mara, this is basically your work. I mean, you are an advocate. Uh, to get legislation passed. You follow closely the inner workings of the United States Senate, the House, all the politics uh, nationally and locally when it comes to these issues, especially these issues, economic issues mostly. How would you describe kind of where the the plan was in its latest iteration in terms of kind of, you know, any of them? I mean, we, I'm sure you could talk, we could talk for hours about what it would do, but maybe some of the highlights that you saw in this bill, I think you saw. Um. Yeah, I mean, there was some good stuff. Look, I'll back up and say that when we first started talking about, you know, Biden's agenda and Build Back Better, we were talking about a three trillion dollar investment and Manchin just slash and burn that nearly in half uh, to what he would even begin to to vote for. And there were two possibilities, really, the way that the House did it, because he cut out how big the package could be. They could have either cut out a lot of the benefits. They could have just said like, all right, well, we can't afford these programs. And so we're going to get rid of them. Or they could cut the amount of time that the programs would go for. And in a lot of places, they went with like, all right, fine, we're still going to do these programs. But instead of doing them for 10 years now, we're going to do them for three years, something like that, which knowing knowing that's smart, because when you give people something and they benefit from it, it's very hard to take it away from them. Yeah. I mean, you know, Unless the GOP comes in power, and then no problem, just snatch it all away. It's it's. <laughs> well, they couldn't, do it. they couldn't do it with Obamacare. Candy from I mean. babies. Yes, they couldn't do it with Obamacare, and there are certainly things that hopefully would stick around. And Mansion is playing that role anyway. Mansion is already saying like, "Oh, you intend this to be ten years, so I don't actually even." So there's really no reason for me to get on board with any of this, and just completely. Um, he's just. He's just rescinding any goodwill that he even pretended to have. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that there's, it's interesting to watch because there is a lot of sort of like, well, we always knew that this was going to happen with him. And maybe that's true. I don't think that people who were, uh, had a little bit of hope in negotiating him were just with him were just sort of wrong outright. Um, I think it probably had to be tried, but it's incredibly frustrating. He's just such a piece of shit, frankly. <laughs> just an absolute piece of shit. Um, and so, yeah, at this moment in time, it's it's dead. I mean, the White House says they're still going to fight for it. We'll now, see. He doesn't. I, what I called him uh, was more specific than a piece of shit, though I don't disagree. Which is like that he's not a serious person. Like he's a caricature of a of a guy who, of a politician who'd been bought and paid for. Like he's a he's like he's got the boat and he's got the Maserati and he's yeah. got he's got a lot of money and and he's not giving what his own people uh, want in in many cases and would uh, clearly benefit from and he's just a disingenuous you know bad faith actor who keeps moving the goalposts he's like like you couldn't script a bought and paid for disingenuous politician any better than this this guy in my opinion no absolutely I mean. You know, his daughter as well is uh, 
it is in her interest to keep drug prices uh, high. She yeah. she profits from that. Like the family is really and Cole has got coal investments that he mm-hmm. says are in a blind trust, but that doesn't make any difference about the regulations around coal. They're they're I mean, come on. No, it, no, it's it's all very much true. I think like the only reason I probably don't go the route of like, hey, he's just uh, you know, bought and paid for is because I I guess I just think so many of them are <laughs> in so many different ways. So he kind of stands out um as just sort of uniquely well, I you them. know that's that's where we might part ways specifically both in the Senate and the house. Like I've interviewed so many of these people. I've, I've looked at where their money comes from. I've looked at what they say and what they do. And you could always say someone's compromised this way or that way, but that's the system that each politician has to work in. And I just feel like it's too cynical to say that we can't have people doing good things in a broken and corrupt political system. I mean, Bernie Sanders, for, for example, I think is, it's hard to argue that that guy's bought and paid for. Sheldon, oh yeah. Sheldon Whitehouse and, and 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 many others, Elizabeth Warren and many others, I would say in the Senate, hey, Maisie Hirono. I mean, you could name, uh, but and, and and I think they're consistent in what they say and what they do. And then in terms of you know who they get their money from, sometimes they're they're more lenient on this or that. But like, no, no, I agree. I'm certainly not writing off sort of all senators or all politicians. I just would also say I think it's more than just the ones that are really ostentatious about it. So it's mansion and it's cinema, but there are additional ones beyond that who um, who play ball more, who go along with it more, but who definitely um, are are not necessarily working from the truest or purest of motives. Um, but I'm not. No, I'm not trying to say that they all are. How about- At the same time, abolish the Senate. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree with with that, but it's too obviously simplistic. We right now, this is the Senate that we have, and I hate the idea that we uh, denigrate grassroots organizing in a place like Georgia. Like the, what they did in Georgia was nothing short of miraculous politically, and we wouldn't even have this without those senators. And there's a lot of amazing real people on the streets organizing now in my community as well I'm a part of. And it's like, we've got to do that. We can't just say the system's broke and we're just going to let our kids and, you know, the, the planet be eaten alive, right? Like, you're not asking me that, are you? You're not you're not bringing this to me and, and uh, in any way implying I would ever take a counter position to organizing is incredibly important and matters and we have to keep trying. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that people listening don't get embittered by the idea Mm. that, you know, that the system is what it is because there's people doing great and amazing work all the time, including you and the organizations that you work with. And that's what I hate that they, they discount the long hours and campaigns, many of which you've worked on and led uh, what they do and what they mean, even when they quote fail, much less, you know, they're always uh, have to be there as 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 fail safes. I don't know what I'm saying. No, one of the like uh, one of the driving principles or, or things that we have to keep in mind while organizing is that the winds are infrequent. Um, if you want to be involved in in making a difference, you need to accept the fact that you're going to lose more than you're going to win. Um, and you're going to feel really devastated and defeated a lot regularly. And you have to kind of uh, determine and find ways to to get through that. And I don't think that that, though, is always just being like, well, nevertheless, we'll carry on. Like, yeah, sometimes that needs to be. But sometimes you need to sit and just be really, really angry and really sad and really despondent and despair and sometimes you need that. You you just you need to let that emotion out and let it exist with the knowledge that you're not going to stay there. You need to be in that place for a little bit until you are ready to get up and start fighting again. And that's OK, too. Um, I think I think there is a lot of frustration and anger and despair right now. But, you know, we're going to get up. And we're going to fight again. We're going to keep going. Well, I think that is. uh well said. And I, and I just want to make that also, you could take that, I think, and make it completely personal. I was kind of thinking about how that also applies to life. Like the most, e- the easiest way to understand it is if, if you're trying to lose weight and you go on a diet and you lose 10 pounds and then you gain two, like you don't give up. You say, oh, oh set back. And I dealt with this more in terms of when I, after I lost my job and I would be like, I'm doing good, doing good. And then I would feel set back and I would start to spiral. 
and a good friend of mine gave me permission. And that's exactly what you're talking about in terms of activism. It's also true of, I think, your own trajectory and journey through life. Do you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's important to allow yourself to feel whatever you're feeling. And, and sometimes you need to feel that for a while. And I mean, some people are really good at feeling their feelings. They don't need any encouragement. But like for me, I've had to sort of learn because I, I fight my feelings all the time. It's like just what I'm keyed up to do. I, I always kind of feel like, no, I should be I should be over here. Why am I here? I don't want to. And I try and like shut it down and move away from it. And that just it doesn't doesn't work very well uh, historically. So I, I've definitely spent a lot of time learning to like, all right, sit with how I'm feeling, write it out. <laughs> you know, write down why I'm feeling this way, what's contributing to this, what do I need to experience or do or be thinking about to feel differently in the future and kind of give myself that sort of roadmap. Um, it it has tended to help. But, you know, life is a long journey of learning these things. It's not easy. What do you um... – how much you write? You're a great writer. My favorite stuff that I've read of yours, and I'm sure there's a lot that you've done, maybe that's even better that I haven't read, but is your post-debate wrap-ups at McSweeney's. They're brilliant and hilarious. But do you write, do you have any kind of writing practice, any kind of artist way, journaling, you know, articles, anything? I mean, like you're always writing in short, great bursts on on social media, on Twitter especially, but when do you write? What makes you write? I'm actually looking back at this year in particular and. I'm kind of, I'm feeling personally um, bummed out <laughs> about how little I did creatively. I didn't really write this year mm. almost at all. Um, and I'm frustrated by that. And I'm trying very hard not to like, not to do what I want to do, which is say, God, you suck. You had all this opportunity. You could have done X, Y, and Z. You didn't fucking do any of it. What the hell is it? Like, I want to beat myself up really badly. Um, and and get really mad at myself uh, for wasting time or wasting opportunities or being lazy or whatever the hell. And I'm trying very hard to be like, hey, you're looking back at this year and you're feeling sad about your lack of creativity. So let's take that as a lesson. You're going to feel better about next year if you do more creative things. Let's try and like, how can you do that? How can, how can I set it up? So Right now, my my creative writing process is just trying to convince myself, you're happier when you're writing things. You should probably mm. start doing that. That's that's as far as I am into that process at the moment. I'm sure that I do something similar in terms of uh, thinking about time and how I spend it. I think a lot about how I spend my time, but I, I don't know how much. I think I have this weird, simple brain that like is kind of like a daily affirmation or something where... I think that one thing I've gotten pretty good at is like putting, putting today away. I think, I think like life is like groundhog day. Like <laughs> when I wake up tomorrow, I'm like, I have another opportunity to do all of the things that I want to do that I need to do today. Uh, today's an opportunity to reach out to this person and tell them that, you know, what all of the list today's a new day. And then when, when that day feels wasted or I get really frustrated that I lost an hour here or this bad thing happened, I'm pretty sure I, I do tell myself and go tomorrow when I go get them, like some silly thing like that. I think I do that. Is that what the is hell that, is wrong with you? <laughs> what is this? What is this beaming optimism and like positivity towards the world? It's incredible. Uh, I don't know if it is. I don't know if it, I, I, I'm not sure it, it is that I think it's just my, my mechanics. I think I have to, but that's a good mechanic to have. That's the sort of thing I'm like, try to learn. I mean, to the point where like my therapist will be like, you need to look in the mirror and tell yourself all the opportunity you haven't like, like I'm trying to force it. And you're just like, I don't know. It just comes naturally. This is just what I do. <laughs> well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't come naturally. It comes from like some probably self help and, and, and a poem or two. Um, there's a, I mean, I get moved by by like sayings, by quotes and shit like that. That's what I'm trying to talk about. But there's a an Emerson poem about like forgetting, you know, what happened yesterday. I used to have it up on the wall here and I thought I had it memorized. But it's this idea of letting go of yesterday and, you know, tomorrow's a new day. And I got to find it. I will also say, though, I'm 
I've always been like a a quote geek, basically. I, I used to like keep a book and I'd write I down anytime I heard a quote that I really liked, which was probably like just sort of early Twitter, really. Just these short little snippets of things from various people lined up in a row. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And I now have, you said you had that on your wall before. I'm just staring up. I'm sitting on my floor, on my bedroom floor right now. And I have, I have two quotes up on my wall at the moment. So. Oh, really? I want to know what they are if you don't mind sharing. But, um, but let me, I found it. Here it is. Emerson. Write it in your heart that every day is the best day in the year. He is rich who owns the day and no one owns the day who allows it to be invaded with fret and anxiety. Finish every day and be done with it. I love that. You've done what you could. Some blunders and absurdities no doubt crept in. Forget them as soon as you can. Tomorrow is a new new day. Begin it well and serenely with too high a spirit to be cumbered by your old nonsense. This new day is too dear with its hopes and invitations to waste a moment on yesterday's. Now, that's flawed. I'm crying, though. <laughs> that's good. how much I get. Oh, that's good. Really but I mean, no, it's I it, it, it's flawed because I think it it dismisses to some extent like real horrible shit that didn't go away. Your addiction oh, didn't yeah. go away yesterday. You, you know, your pain, your loss didn't go away because the because you went to bed. So I think it's it could be there's some nuance. My wife has been critical of that for that reason. I think it's fair, totally fair. But I still kind of live by that. No, I don't. To me, I don't. Maybe I, you know, I, like I said, I was kind of emotionally moved. So maybe I didn't um, listen as carefully as I ought to once I started feeling <laughs> an emotion about it. But I, I didn't hear it like that necessarily anyway, because I don't I don't hear life like that. Like, OK, your addiction is still there tomorrow. Yes, of course it is. Are you trying to completely be done with your addiction tomorrow? You probably aren't. You're trying to be a bit better. You're trying to do something. You're trying to make one step towards something. You know, I'm not expecting tomorrow I will have written the novel I want to write. But gosh, if I could just write a couple sentences, <laughs> like that would be better than what I did today. Um, and I think that's what I'm sort of hearing. Um, anyway, I don't What's know. What's good? I, I'm going to, I'll put that in the show notes for people and uh, if people want to read it. What are you, can you share yours? What you got? I love, by the way, I love that you, like, I, I'm a sucker for like surrounding myself with mantras and quotes that I can, I can read. And I I've always done that. I even used to write my goals and post them up on the wall so I could see them. Like when I can, I have dry erase boards, when I can see stuff, it helps my mind. But what do you got? Well, actually I have downstairs um, where I can see it. This is very, but it's just this little ceramic tile um, that says rest, you beautiful, busy idiot which I just like seeing all the time. It's like very helpful to me because I always feel like I have to be occupied. Um, so anyway, that's downstairs. I but, love that. <laughs> but uh, right now, the ones I'm looking at that are on my wall, um, the first is Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Um, I have that one up there because, man, it's really easy to doubt that. And it's nice to hear it. And then uh, the other is the uh, Nelson Mandela quote, it always seems impossible until it is done, which is another one that I just like to be reminded of every day. Because, uh, yeah, <laughs> it seems impossible. And I, I myself am someone who often looks at things and says, there's no way. Um, do they ever work do, when you say that? You, what, do, can you say what usually happens or you, what are we looking at personal or, or political or like larger goals? I don't know what you mean when, when you look at a thing and say, no way. I'm not sure exactly what thing you're looking at. Is on. Oh, the, the, it always seems impossible until it is done um, is something that it, it tends to help me with my work, I think, because I think then I, I, you know, I'm I'm constantly up against impossible tasks at work. Right. Changing the world is an impossible task, but right. I don't know. People have done it over and over and over again. So clearly we can as well. Um, and then I have one more quote that I use Ooh. all the time too, if you want to hear it. <laughs> I'm not Love staring it. at it. So I, I think I've memorized it. It's not difficult, but it's Arthur Ashe's, um, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. That is probably my favorite quote of all time. And that is the one I return to the most because the other thing I, the challenge that I am up against often with myself is feeling like, 
well, what you would really need to do if you really wanted to do this is you'd need all this money and all this time and all these people and it would have to be, you know, and then I don't have any of that, so I can't do anything. Uh, and so mm. that's, I go to that one a lot, that it just start where you are, <laughs> look around use, you, what do you have, but, use what you have and do what you can. And that might not be everything, but it will have been something. And that matters to me. I love, I love all those quotes. It's also interesting that uh, not one of these quotes is from a white man. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't occur to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm right. I have the names. Margaret I'm just Mead. really woke, Pete. Okay. Margaret you Mead, know. Nelson Mandela, Arthur Ashe. I just wrote them down. That is I, funny, actually. No, I didn't I even. Like, oh, look at that. Occur to me. Huh. Well, my only one was from the whitest of men, <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson. Who he actually invent, invented whiteness. I'm pretty sure. He actually did. He well, he yeah. um, he would uh, yeah. climb birch trees only because they were so white. <laughs> I believe it's Emerson who would, in a, in a windstorm, he would climb to the top of, of a tree and he would basically surf on it. Like the tree would sway and he would be at the tip. And like during a windstorm, he would climb all the way to the top of a tree and, and basically ride it. That sounds apocryphal. I don't believe that. Maybe you're right, but I, I don't but know. I, I mean, it's, it's a fun vision, but I see it more for like Winnie the Pooh or something. I don't know. It's, yeah, it's, 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 easy. <laughs> it's definitely an easy thing to say you did last night. That's you'll fair. Never believe, you'll never believe what I did. Climbed up to that top of the tree and rode it like a surfboard. I don't think Waldo did that. <laughs> talking about climbing and riding trees. He was sitting by the fire writing poetry, if you ask me. Look, life was boring back then, you know? You had to invent your own fun. Seriously, yes. I mean, I'd be climbing trees, too, if I didn't have my phone. Yes, the phone. Do you ever look at your 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 kids? I keep trying to correct our peers and uh, who are so judgmental of our kids. You're always in front of the phone. I am always like, just a reminder, you would have been too. If you had this amazing thing with all of this connectivity to all of your friends in the world, you would have been around that. We, you wouldn't have been running around outside and doing all the things we did because of how amazing that, compu that, that the phone is, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I wouldn't have been running around outside if I wasn't kicked out anyway. Like, I just wanted to read. So, I mean, I do think that you do have to, like, you know, sometimes we just want to sort of sit in our cozy places and, and do what we want to do. And it can be good to kick kids outside a little bit, too. Or grownups, for that matter. I don't mean to. Oh, I'm, no, I'm I, saying. I want someone to kick me outside in general. But, yes, absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Tear the phone out of their hands and kick them outside. Don't get me wrong. It's this idea that you're casting judgment on your kid. What's wrong with you? Nothing. It's a fucking no, no. supercomputer. In there. No, absolutely. And the other thing, too, is, I mean, it's it's connectivity to other humans like it's not necessarily yeah. it can be very isolating and solitary sure. depending on how you're using it but for the most part it's actually very social and and there's a lot of interpersonal stuff happening uh through this little magic box so yeah there's like 500 different ways to find out how much happier everybody else is than you it's wonderful you have that instant depression in your hand i mean like you used to have to go searching for that depression man now we just do just beam it right to you do you feel like the worst people are the people who only share their social media photos from their happiest moments, including in mainly like their tropical vacations? I feel like there are some people that that's all we get. And like, come on, give me some bullshit. Give me some nonsense. You're not living life on a beach. You, yeah. work, you work in a cubicle. That doesn't bother me because, I mean, people use their social media in different ways. Some are using it really specifically for others. Others are just using it as their own little like oh, this is where I put my photos that I want to, you know, remember or have. And other people, yeah, they want to project a certain person that they maybe are. I really or disagree. Not. I, I, if you're going to post like five photos of vacations with you and your beautiful family, the sixth photo should be of you crying. <laughs> I, that would be an interesting, you need to start a platform because then you can put that right into the user notes right there. Like for every, every time that I, get annoyed at my jealousy of your life i need to see that you yes. had diarrhea yesterday basically and i like, couldn't move off the toilet like I, that's what i need to know yes yeah. for every six photo i want you to get your kidney stone <laughs> facial expression yes i want to see a letter of rejection i want to see someone got... cutting you off whatever I might be being a disingenuous i think i've gotten a, a better a much better handle on the idea of of fomo for, for sure. Like, I really think I'm pretty like stable with my kind of mindset and my work and my life. But I feel like I've gotten better. It's, it was, you know, horrible when I first started as a comic. Mm. Uh, I used to go on websites and see who was performing where. That's where it really began for me. And then, you know, all of the normal stuff with anybody having whatever they have and doing whatever they do. But 
I think it's re- that it's it's easier for adults to get a better understanding of that. But I think kids like my daughter at the end of the summer, she's like, I had the most boring summer. Everybody had a better summer than me. I'm like, what? You had an amazing summer by every possible measure. And you must be thinking of just of what you've seen on social media with people doing things that, like, come on. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, obviously, I think there's a lot of research being done on how social media negatively affects sort of young minds from that particular perspective. So definitely, I think that's there. But I also think like, I I think that there's, you know, that existed pre-social media too, because you only heard about the cool things that people did. They weren't talking to you about like the, you know, the shitty times that they had. So I mean, like it, it was there to some degree too. And we all have to like learn what to do with jealousy. You know, what what do we do with that feeling of insecurity or that, you know, others have stuff a lot better. I don't know. I think everyone has to kind of grapple with that. So another good goddamn answer or thought. So <laughs> your, birthday, your birthday is Friday. Any is birthday? Wow. Uh, huh. Isn't it the 24th? Oh, yeah. Is that Friday? Huh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any traditions for you? Is there anything we can do? Uh, no. I mean, my birthday really, I, I gave it up. It, it really is Christmas Eve. I, I would sort of jokingly make a thing of it now, but no, there, I have no traditions. None. I got nothing for my birthday. Like nothing that is consistent. Except, I, wish for, I wish for you to write a journal entry. You know what? I might try and do that. Maybe I'll try and write something funny. Maybe I can be funny again. Do you have faith in me? Do you believe in me? Do you think I can be funny again? Please? I think do anybody, you? Do you? I think everybody does. It's just a matter. I like you're. It's always annoyed me about you how funny you are about so many different things very quickly, and it's kind of annoying if somebody isn't necessarily practicing that. So if you're asking me, <laughs> like if you're not actively, you know, working on, you know, a a, a, tw- a tweet, much less, you know, an essay or any other kind of humor, I'm like, oh man. Well, I'm really wasting that muscle because I'm over here fucking spinning my wheels for a decent tweet, much less joke, taking me hours and still not getting to where you got within a minute. So, yeah, frustrating. Yeah, I was a little annoyed, actually, at the entire idea that you just said of working on a tweet. I'm like, what's working on a tweet? This is just like what I spit exactly. out at any given moment. And then- I rest. I rest my face. <laughs> Half the time I just go, oh, don't post that. But then every so often I'm like, go ahead. You can post it. It's all right. Well, why don't you just start then writing some of my tweets for God's sake? <laughs> Punch my shit up if if you're looking for <laughs> for uh, some shit that you can't or don't want to say. Eh, send it to your old friend Pete. For some reason, the idea of uh, being creative and being funny, I feel like uh, invisibly being funny to boost a, a, another comic white man maybe it's like maybe it wouldn't give me the same satisfaction as doing something myself maybe i don't know just oh I'm, and let me be clear i will pay you the, <laughs> i'm not expecting you to feel purpose driven i see well hey you know it is purpose weird it's cream baby cash rules everything around me Let's i've never it. been able to like produce for another person i can't you know no no i feel and like then, i've done a lot of that so. i think it's hard to do my producers that i never worked with any producers who even wanted to like produce for me. I begged them and tried to pay them to, to write and to do extra stuff. And they just, it's a hard thing for people to do, I think. Uh, but obviously a lot of people do it really well. They, you know, are awesome at writing jokes for other people's voices, but I've never been much good at it. I mean, I've never been specifically just that, but I have definitely, I've definitely written for other people. I mean, like my first, uh, one of my earlier, earliest relationships when I was, you know, late teens, or early twenties, uh, was with someone who was a stand-up comic and I didn't really know it at the time that I was writing his jokes but I was I only know now that I was like writing his jokes but in my mind we were just like kind of joking around and then the jokes that I said would end up in his stand-up set um, that's uh he never should have ended that relationship I'm sure you only made him better oh I ended the relationship that, that was that was all me oh I I did I say he never should have ended that relationship? You yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. His yeah. fault. Um, I just assumed that he must have somehow wanted to shoot himself in the foot, but weird. Yeah, to date that's usually me. I like to wield the gun in these things. <laughs> it's weird to date a comedian. Dating a comedian is, uh, is a bizarre thing. Sometimes yeah. two comedians date each other because of like. I was going to yeah, say, I, have you dated another comedian? No, but I know. No, never. 
but I know a lot of comedians who date each other. And I know a lot of comedians, you know, I know like there's like a support group for spouses of comedians. Really? To some extent, like they get, like my wife is like her best friend is Joe Manarese's wife. And like, there's, yeah, there's a lot of similar shit there, especially for people who aren't necessarily like your complete, or your complete opposite. They would never want to be on stage and try to make people laugh, you know? Right. But, which is probably the best type of person to be with a comedian, someone who's just I like, don't know, or or two comedian. I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of comedians, Rich Voss and Bonnie McFarlane, Al Ducharme and and um, Bernadette Pauly, like just and many more that are. Uh, I don't know. They probably support the hell. That's what I'm thinking. Like when you're dating this guy because you're really funny, like you supported his comedy. It can be, it, you know, there's no judgment. But I mean, I would the idea of having somebody like constantly giving you ideas for bits is great. I yeah, think. no, I mean, I actually that that was not. Uh, the reason that I ended the relationship, it was completely separate from that. I, I actually really enjoyed that. The only sort of thing looking back is that it never occurred to me that I could do it myself. Like, I just always felt like the the girlfriend who was kind of, you know, who was funny, but it didn't occur to me that I could be putting out any of these jokes in any format. Well, it's probably one of the primary reasons why you have a massive Twitter following without other huge amount of exposure. I mean, it's people just love taxes, Pete. They just love taxes. Well, yeah, but you're (laughs) only tweeting about tax. Nothing but tax. (laughs) I mean, your last six tweets had to do with uh, tangentially the holidays, I think. Come on. Yeah, no, that's true. I could not really say anything about any of this stuff because you have a lot I of, tried to, to tweet about lot. it. I was like, ooh, this is too angry. I feel like you have a lot of holiday COVID material. We have- <laughs> yeah, which is great because, you know, performing in front of large groups of people seems like a, a real natural thing to do right now. So, Good you know, a lot, of, a lot of places for me to put that material. All right. I, I took do you- weird voices today. I'm sorry. I took you way too long. I know you have uh, a meal uh, waiting. Thank you so much for talking to me. As always, it's so great to kick off our week with you. We went all, uh, as we often do, like in a lot of different places, which I love. And it feels good to have these conversations and people love when we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. 